All right, let me see. I have the monitors. All right. I'm a little bit nervous, I won't lie, but I'd actually like to start with a question for the audience, if you don't mind. So, Blender, as we all love, but raise your hand if you believe that Blender is commonly used on hobbyist level and smaller scale projects. All right, all right, good majority. And now, please be honest. Raise your hand if you believe that Blender is commonly used on high-end big-budget productions. All right, not as many hands this time. But sadly, high-end clients, they also think this way. They hear Blender and they might picture a tool meant for hobbyist level. They don't consider it on the same level as other industry giants like Houdini or Maya. But I'd like to bring a slightly different perspective to this. My name is Turpal, though most people know me online as Alex, and I run a CG studio where we've been using Blender as our main tool for the last three years. And we've actually gotten quite far with Blender. We've pushed it really far, where people have been questioning, wait, is this even Blender? Even the big boss himself questions us in an email. <laughs> so how is it then that we managed to get this far? Well, when you reach a certain level, right, you notice, sadly, that Blender alone, it isn't enough. But then again, no tool is, so we opt for a hybrid workflow. Now, this is nothing surprising. We use Houdini for simulations, Substance for texturing. You know, our compositing is done in After Effects. Many people do this way. But then, Alex, this presentation is called, you know, Cycles is better than you think. Why are you handicapping cycles like this? Well, we do use Blender for a lot of the production, the modeling, the UV, the early stages, a lot of the production, the rendering, which is what I'm going to talk about right now. So no, we use Blender for a lot. It's just that once it gets very specialized, we complement it with a tool that works really well in just that one area. Now, next, I'd love to share actually our latest show reel, where you can get a glimpse of what we've been able to achieve with Blender leading the way. So let me just double check that this works. And that there is some. Thank you. And thank you to the great team who've been able to make it all happen. But then, how do you get these realistic results? Well, there's way too much that goes into this than I can possibly talk about in 20 minutes, but I'd like to focus on three key, key things that we've noticed that I'd like to share. So when the need arises, let's start with glass. The, here are some still frames from our Nothing animated project. And this was a spec trailer. And lots of people, they thought, wait, it looks like Octane. Wow, these glass shaders are nice. Is this Redshift? Is this maybe LuxCore? But no, it is Cycles. And then once people noticed, wait, this is Cycles. Please show us your glass shader. So I thought this time, all right, I'll share it. You might need to bring your phones out because it's quite brilliant. I want you to remember this one. Ready? 
It's not even a drogue, that is actually the glass shader. And that value added into the thickness, I won't lie, I have no idea what it does. I tried to like disable it, enable it, I saw no difference, but our modeler added it in there, so I just left it in. I didn't even bother touching it. <laughs> so then this goes to show, okay, Cycles is able to handle glass renderings quite well. But these results, they were more achieved by the light, actually, and the lighting. I noticed when you render glass, right, and especially if you have like area lights or some kind of source light, the shape itself is so harshly visible in the light itself. So the trick this time around was to fade out the edges, as you can see here. Once the light, <coughs> excuse me, once the light reaches, you know, the edge of the source light, we fade it out. In a reflection, an area light would look like this. So you'd add an image texture, fade out the edges. You can take it one step further and add a high dynamic range image to it as well. Now, this isn't visible in the presentation itself, but the center of the image is a lot brighter than the edges. So you'd get the same effect. But all right, that's glass. Now the next one, what about something much bigger, like a citywide shot? Now this shot, it was relatively noise-free and it rendered in just below seven minutes on a single 1490. So that is, that's actually very impressive for an animated piece. So let me share a render setting, starting with resolution. 4K native. Okay, now it starts to get more interesting. Then what about noise threshold or denoising? No, we don't use that. We actually denoise in compositing. And then the next trick that most people use is bounces, you know. This is a, another combination of bounces I haven't seen many people use. 32 everywhere. Okay, now the render time is getting really interesting. We basically maxed out all the settings and still get a very impressive render time. And the way we achieve this in such a big scene at 4K is, I've noticed when you have multiple lights, they kind of fight for the pixel and it gets very noisy. But in a linear workflow, if you group lights together, then render them separately, you get a much cleaner image with less samples. So that's what we've done. We take first the area lights, all the spotlights around. Then we render just the neon lights. Then just the billboards. And then just the windows. Then when you add all of this together, you get a very clean image. And you need less samples for each of the images. And if you render XRs, add them together, you get a very impressive image. Now, it was not seven minutes per image. It was seven minutes total for all of them. And that's where it gets very impressive. This is a method we use on all projects. If we have some lights that are fighting with each other, we render them separately. You get a lot of control and you need less samples. But let's go really up close. So this is then a cinematic teaser we made for the video game Hela. And there's one specific shot here that's very difficult. Now, the requirement was to have it realistic. So we're going up close on the ground and there's 8K textures. We have our furry friend at the end. The motion blur is rendered in engine, depth of field in engine, volumetric fog in engine, everything is in engine. The only thing missing here is a smoke sim and then we have the worst of the worst. Now, there's a specific issue we had here. So let's look at the raw render and then let's zoom in on our furry friend over here. Now, I want to pay attention to the fur itself because this is where it became very difficult. We couldn't make out those tiny details on the front neck. So how did we achieve that? Well, we actually rendered the mouse separately. And this is yet another common technique we use. When the scenes get very difficult, they eat up all the VRAM, you can then render them in layers separately. Now this time we, <coughs> we rendered the mouse separately without the fog. And now Cycles could pick out those tiny hair details in the fur. Because otherwise, when we had the fog enabled, the volumetric lights, no matter how many samples, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, it didn't work. But this way, we could get what we wanted. And those were my three things. Now this next thing was, and this is a little bit of a touchy subject, but I felt like it is so overpowered, I actually needed to share it. And that is how to get these kinds of results very, very fast. And that is AI. But not the way you may think it is, because 
Our works are not created by the AI. Actually, we let our artists get trained by an AI. Now, with Midjourney, it makes a generation and you know spits out whatever it thinks your prompt is. But I really wanted an AI where you could, your input was your render. Now, there is, there is one called Magnific. Now, Blender Guru, he made a newsletter about this and called it the Make Your Render Better button, where you use it at the end of a production. We had already been using this for a couple of months by then, but this doesn't work because we use animations. Like, this doesn't work for us. So, what actually becomes quite interesting is when it makes a nice guess, like it generates something, and it's nice. We take it, let's make that. And let me just demonstrate the speed of this. So this is an old intro for Nick's Mercs that we did, and I tested this for the first time on this project. Now this environment, specifically this opening shot, it took about three days to make. So then I gave it to Magnific, create a couple of generations, and what I really liked, I made it in 3D. And we went from this to this. And this was not made by the AI. This was done by me. But the AI gave me suggestions, and the ones I liked, I implemented. And I actually took the timing on this. From here to here, two hours and 30 minutes. Now that kind of speed, it's, it is so unfair, it is so overpowered, that I was a little bit like, I don't actually want to share this. Because it's kind of like our, how do you say it? like our secret weapon. But then, you know, I've been talking with the team and thought, if another studio knew of this method, would I want them to share it? And I said yes. So that's why I decided to share it as well. But let's test it on an actual real project that we did. Now, here's an environment. This one been <coughs> kit patched together by our journalist, Elliot. This was for the weekend for one of his m music videos. And we had four days on this, which is very little time. So two days in, Elliot comes, and then he's like, Alex, all right, this is what I come. I'm not fully sure what to do next. Can you give me some advice? All right. I gave a couple of ones, but then I also thought, let's give it to the AI, because it can generate outputs and test things much faster. Because when you do it yourself, right, you're not sure if something works, you need to test it. It takes time. But when you can input your own render to the AI and it does the testing for you with whatever prompt you give, you get generations really, really fast. So we gave it to the AI and this is what it spat out. Oh, all right, that looks super realistic. Let's try and make it. So we go up close, this is Elliot's render, and then let's see what the AI makes. Okay, what in the hot garbage is this? What happened to the doorway? Why is there a picture frame behind the lamps? Why is this wall fading halfway up? What happened to the piano? It's no longer a piano. Well, it looks bad. Now, that's where it gets interesting, because once it looks bad, you just ignore it. But every now and then, and actually very often, it guesses something right. Like the red wall here, there's some wear and tear. Of course, let's add that. The lamps, they, they have this interesting orange shape on the wall. I, I like that. Let's take that. How about this center wall? All right, so this is the generation. Oh, the texture is more eccentric, more contrast. The wood is also more reflective. We like that. How about these floorboards? Oh, they're a bit more three-dimensional and also more reflective. In this case, we like that for the project. We want that. Then how about this wall? Now, pay attention to that pillar. The corridor, it actually continues in around the corner. The AI suggested to close it off and put a chair there. Yeah, actually, we like that. I thought that looked nice. But then this clock, it turned it into a door. Well, we don't want that, so we ignore it. And this then continues, and we do a couple of iterations, and we have only two days left. So we gave it to the AI, and then Elliot, next two days, went from this to this. And him being, at the time, a mediocre artist, this kind of level of quality and speed with the help of the AI, it is nothing that can beat it with how fast it is. And what gets really interesting is that some of our medium level artists, as they get more and more trained by the AI, they recognize and remember what it's going to suggest. So now they know. 
Before, maybe he wouldn't have thought about the lamps, you know, the spot lamp shapes. Now, to be fair, we forgot to add it here, but we, we don't comment on that. But that's something I thought, oh, that's very nice. Now I remember. The, the wooden reflectiveness, okay, that's very nice. Now I remember. Now I remember. Every time it guesses right, we remember it. And I wouldn't actually recommend this for beginners, because you actually need to make the thing. And if you're a beginner, maybe you don't know modeling, texturing, sculpting, all of the things you need to do. And then you need to have the core knowledge to not accidentally guess something wrong. You know, what if the AI makes a mistake? Because very often it actually does color shifts as well, where our compositor sometimes is like, wait, this color grading, it's very nice, let's do it. Other times it completely messes it up. So that's why, as a beginner, maybe stay away from it. And then again, for the AI to work, it's magic. Your input actually has to be somewhat decent. It doesn't generate completely from nothing like Midjourney does. You need to give it something to work with. But then for an intermediate user, it works really well. For an advanced user, really well. If you're an expert, okay, maybe you don't need Magnific so much already because the mistakes it does, you kind of know them and you're already at that level. But the speed and growth you get by using it this way, I thought it was so incredibly fast. We, we had another studio that we worked really close with that were far ahead of us. And using Magnific, we managed to catch up really fast to the point where they were like, oh, that's awesome. Here, take, uh, give us some of our products. We trust our brand name with you guys. And that has been incredibly awesome. So the general takeaway from this is that it isn't so much about, you know, now this is going to sound cliche, so much about the tool. Cycles can handle quite difficult projects. You just need to set it up. And it's not about the render settings either. The real magic happens with how you set up the scene. And just like everything else, AI is a tool. Now, this is where it gets a bit touchy, like, oh, AI here, AI there, like, is it ethical, etc. I guess that's uh, just a question you have to answer for yourself and what you think. But I thought I'd share this because I genuinely believe it is so overpowered that no, you, you just get trained at an extreme level. Thank you.